there have been calls, of course, to shut down some of these homes, defund some of the homes. What are your thoughts on, on those calls? Um, well, that we can't just shut down any institution just like that. There's a process in place. And apart from that, also, once we have children in any facility, Rhoda, once the authority allows the facility to operate, then we are duty-bound as a government to support the welfare of those children. And that is why we continue under the Payment for Child system to provide for the care and well-being of the boys and the girls who are in our facilities. Because people have been asking me, why it is you that take away the money? We can't. If we take away the money, how would those children survive? We must remember a number of these facilities would have been established as under charitable acts, under charitable organizations. And for them to operate is based on the goodwill of corporate Trinidad and Tobago and some men and women who are so inclined to make donations. And we recognize when we were examining what was happening across the board that we needed to step in to help to provide for the basic needs of our children who have, because by no virtue of their choice, who have to be placed in an institution. So that is why the payment for child system was introduced and that is why it's going to continue. Under that system, it is still we have according to age ranges, um, a certain sum of money going to each child per month, not only for the food, the food and the shelter, but also to help offset some of the overheads of running the institution. And apart from that, there's an additional $2,000 made available per child if there's a need for any psychosocial intervention or any special medical intervention that is not available through the public sector or that is not ready, ready, readily available at the time that the intervention is required. Hi folks, good evening. You would have been hearing excerpts from an interview that I did with um, Minister Ayanna Webster Roy yesterday. Um, she's not in a position to be a part of the live this evening. I mean, today is Mother's Day. I can understand that. And she would have also returned to Tobago for events that are taking place in her constituency today. However, I do have two other guests because I wanted her to be on and part of this conversation, this discussion that we're going to have about um, abuses at the state homes. However, she did grant me a 20 minute interview yeah, roughly 20 minutes and I will put that in, entire interview up on social media up, up on YouTube so that you can listen to the entire interview with her thereafter but I felt that it was useful to at least have some of her voice be a part of the discussion this evening now this report has been the source of a, you know a, a lot of discussion and a lot of media stories in the last in the last week or so because it would have been tabled in parliament it would have been tabled in parliament um not this friday gone the previous friday and of course there's been lo loads and loads and loads of stories on it before i get into too much more let me say good evening to everyone who is here on the live this evening and also to my two guests who are waiting in the green room to to be able to to, to be brought on screen but before I bring my two guests on screen, I am going to talk a little bit about, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the report that got me interested in this new report that took place. So we've had state homes in Trinidad and in Tobago since the colonial era, since the 1800s. Somewhere around the mid 1800s, we would have had state homes be um, um, set up and they would have been set up under various religious organizations. At that point in time, the two major religious organizations in the country would have been the Anglican Church and the Roman Catholic Church. So they would have set up organizations for, they would have set up state homes for children, for elderly people, for you know poor people you know there would have been a, a a number of things that they would have put in place as social safety nets flash forward to the 20th century and now the 21st century and we still have those homes that are partly um managed by religious organizations um funded by the state 
with employees that are either working under the state or working um, with the religious organization. And we still have this pattern of abuse and trauma coming out of these homes because it's not new. None of this is new, which is why the outrage in the last week has seemed and sounded like tired outrage, like we're tired of hearing these things over and over and over again. Now, um, the first time these homes fell under legislation would have been about 1925. And it's important for us to talk about legislation from then because we're still going to be talking about legislation now. We have between 1925 to now, developed and created a slew of laws, lots of different laws that would allow us, you know, the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, to be able to hold these organizations and institutions to account for the things that we are hearing happening in the institutions. So you have to start to ask yourself, but well, why is it such a problem? Why is it so difficult to be able to hold these organizations to account when we hear about these abuses? And hopefully, my two guests will be able to clarify those things for us. So the, these organizations, as I was saying, tend to be managed by a religious board. And that's for the, that's for the main homes because there are a number of homes here. But I'm going to get into that. I don't want to jump the gun too much. So the, major, the four main homes would have been run by religious organizations. There are now three main homes. The fourth one was closed at St. Michael's Boys. And based on that report, it seems as if they plan to open, reopen St. Michael's later on in 2022, but under a different sort of um, management system. And hopefully that happens and hopefully the new management system works. So we've got three large state homes and we also have a number of smaller state homes. So there are, in total, 39 state homes or 39 children's homes, children's centers in Trinidad and Tobago. 21 of them are registered, 18 are unregistered. And in going through the documents that are, the, that are housed in this report that was tabled two Fridays ago, you're looking at that information, you're thinking to yourself, how can we have 18 on licensed, not unregistered, 18 unlicensed homes within the larger structure of homes that we have here. Again, a question that I am hoping one of my guests will be able to explain and answer for me. So we have legislation. We also have a UN convention. So in 1991, we become signatories to the UN Convention for the Rights of the Child. And what we sign on to is basically to say that without reservation, we as a country are going to protect the rights of children in Trinidad and Tobago. I want those of you that are hardcore into beating children to just let that sink into your head. That since 1991, as a country, we have said <laughs> that we are going to do everything in our control to sign or to protect the rights of children. So that happens in 1991. And between 1991 and 2015, there are a number of committees, there are a number of task force, there are a number of things that are, that are kind of happening, but happening in a half-hearted way. And then by 2015, we finally proclaim the Children's Act. And one of the first things that we do after having proclaimed that Children's Act is to put an end to child marriage. And putting an end to child marriage was one of the things that had to be done because child marriage is seen as abuse against minors. I'm wondering how many of us remember the huge debate that was centered around child marriage and holding on to child marriage and keeping the institution of child marriage because there were persons who felt that it was the right of men to still be able to get married adult males to get married to young females even though since 1991 we would have signed on to this convention and we would have agreed that child marriage is a form of child abuse and yet here we were or there we were in 2016 arguing not everybody but certain um sectors of the population 
arguing to be able to hold on to child marriage as a practice. So by 2015, that legislation is passed. And one of the things that happens with us passing that legislation is the Children's Authority. That organization is set up and it is set up as a body that has oversight over all of these homes and centers for minors. So, in February of this year, this happened. I have to make sure I do the thing properly. In February of this year, this story came, um, came onto my radar. And it came onto my radar because the headline was so salacious. Wards groomed for politicians and businessmen. And when I read the story, there was a lot of allegations, a lot of generalized statements made in the story. But there was at no point in time any, um, how to say, hard details, hard evidence, hard facts. The gentleman in the picture is Robert Sagba. Robert Sagba was, back in 1997, um, instructed or given um, instruments by Manohar Ramsaran, who was then the MP um, for Shogunas West, and he was also the Minister for Social Development. He was given the responsibility by Manohar Ramsaran to do an investigation into the homes, right, the various children's homes in the country. And Robert, the report was called the Sabga report. Robert Sabga would have done the report, and based on his own words, in this Annalisa Paul story of February the 20th, 2022, he then hit the report, silenced the report, did absolutely nothing with the report. And so nobody, nobody knows, or rather the public um, doesn't have a recollection of the findings of that report. You can go back and find some newspaper stories, but the report was never laid in Parliament for the public to be able to look at the report. The report was, um, do I have the page with the persons who were responsible for the report? Yes, I do. And let me bring that up for you all to take a look at it. So there we go. Robert Sabga, Diana Mahabir Wyatt, Halcyon York Young, Basdale Gayadin Catchpole, Valerie Rollins, and Sita Bihari. Those persons were responsible for doing this report. And there are a couple very interesting things that would have taken place um, in, the re in the report. And I put up a couple pages of the report for you all to, to look at earlier on today. And there were, a number of, there were a number of very interesting findings. But what stood out, or what stood out as the major findings, was that at these organizations, at the institutions, it seemed as if there was a healthy amount of mismanagement taking place. A lot of abuse of children, whether physical or sexual abuse. And in some instances, misappropriation of funds. There were some institutions that were collect that was collecting money, and it was collecting money under false pretenses because there were no children at the homes. There were a number of homes where sexual abuse and physical abuse took place. And with the sexual abuse and the physical abuse that was taking place, the children were not receiving any sort of medical attention or psychological assistance after after the abuse was um, was reported. As a matter of fact, things were so badly handled at these homes that persons, staff members, people who are working at the homes, continued to be able to have access to these children to continue to abuse them, whether sexually or physically. And when one of the persons, one of the, one of the rapists, right? When one of the rapists was eventually fired or asked to resign, the, 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 the person at the head of that home, at the head of a, a, a nun, found a job for the person, the person accused of, of raping these children, found a job for the person at the St. Anne's Mental Hospital. So you move a predator from one group of vulnerable persons and put that predator to then work in an environment with other vulnerable persons. 
And so, as you go through the report, you realize part of the reason that Robert Sabga and the, his other commissioners didn't make this report public was because they didn't want to upset the religious status quo in the country. There was also enough information in the report that implied that the political status quo would have also had some problems. And why do I say that? Because of this page that I was able to take a look at only just before the live started. So there is, or there was rather, an organization referred to as the National House for Family Reconciliation. And the National House of Family Reconciliation was managed by the brother of Suruj Rambachan. And I saw that and I thought to myself, so you had the brother of someone linked to the government at that point in time, having set up a center for children, receiving money, and there was, according to report, according to the report, sorry, there were no children there. So if there are no children there, is it that the home was receiving money under false pretenses? And then, this then leads to questions about the administration and the releasing of funds to these homes from ministries. So those are some of the questions and the problems raised back in 1997. And then you come forward to 2022. And when you come forward to 2022, you begin to realize that there is a lot that really and truly has not changed. So, so you have in 2010 a committee appointed by the Minister of the People and Social Development. Then you have in December 2013 a Child Protection Task Force that was set up. And then you have what is it the children's ombudsman that would that would have um that was a recommendation made and the children's ombudsman has been set up i think that is a good idea and then of course 2021 this particular team and the new team would have been led by justice judith jones now when i spoke to minister webster roy i asked her i said you know what brought this about and what the minister said to me was that there were a number of problems, a number of issues that would have been discovered at the various homes, but it was things that you were hearing, anecdotal information, and they wanted hardcore information, hardcore evidence, a scientific study or a rigorous study done to bring information before the public to indicate uh, to people, this is what is really taking place to bring pressure to bear. Now, I'm going to bring on my guests now because I want them to join the conversation and I want us to be in a position to, I'm going to, whatever questions you have for them, please feel free to put it up in the chat and I am, you know, I will pose them um, as they, as they come, as they come on or as they become necessary. So, let me say good evening to trauma specialists. Hanif Benjamin. So Hanif, what I forgot to find out whether or not you you are Dr. Hanif Benjamin. Not quite yet. But soon? Soon. Keep good. praying. <laughs> good, 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 good. Happy to hear that. So Hanif, good evening and thank you so much for agreeing to be a part of this and, and, and for, to, for joining me in the conversation. My first question to you is going to be this. Why has it been so difficult for the children's authority and of course i'm asking you this in your capacity as someone who was once um in charge of the children's authority why has it been so hard How, why has it been so hard for the children's authority to do on what it's meant to be doing on paper which is to keep an eye on these homes um to make sure homes are licensed um and if homes are defaulting you know revoking their license why has it been so difficult I think the difficulty is not as as easy or as clear cut as people are making it out to be, mm -hmm. um, and it is not as quick um, as people are making it out to be as well. Mm -hmm. I honestly believe that we have to understand that the Children's Authority is a new creature, well, relatively new, 
And the issues that we're talking about is issues that have been clad for many, 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 many years. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes a, a situation where they created these laws or legislation and gave the authority some powers mm -hmm. to do some things. But in doing those some things, what they did not take into account is that the entire system surrounding the Children's Authority also must be working uh, together. They must be working from a synergistic approach. And that's the first major issue that we have. You, you have the Children's Authority, you have the Children's Court, you have the ministries, and you have religious organizations. And all of them, if they are not on the same page, then we're spinning top in mud. Mm -hmm. Then we have a Children's Authority who seemingly has the mandate to license, but when you are to license a home that has been sitting on a piece of land since 1932 and cannot be moved and cannot be refurbished, what do you do? And so moving or closing or whatever it is, it's not as simple as people believe it is to be. Explain to me what, what you mean by the home cannot be licensed. Because I was surprised to see that we had so many unlicensed homes that were still functioning. So explain mm -hmm. what allows for a home to be licensed and then what makes it so that a home cannot be licensed. Right, and I think that is a powerful question to be delineated here tonight. Uh, when they were creating this legislation again, and in, in my view, um, law and practice has to come together, otherwise it makes no sense. And, and, and there's always a situation where the law is not coming together with practice. Mm -hmm. And I will explain that later on when we talk about the legislative reform. And you created these laws and you created a list of things uh, or codes that a home must come up to. For example, your ceiling must be a certain height. If you have fans, your fans must be at a certain distance from the ground. You must have water in a particular way. You must have bed spacing. So many different things that include fire, water, codes, electricity, all of these things. Just like your house. See, and they're coming to life in your house. You need to have these things done. But when you look at the homes that is in Trinidad and Tobago, they are not rich people. More likely than not, they are patronage of either some government grant or from businesses or from well-wishers yeah and so more likely than not you have a little house somewhere mm -hmm. give or take and when you go now to license this woman you said these are the things you need to be to get done and these things are coming up to four hundred and fifty thousand dollars what do you do so you get to a point where you get to so far and you cannot go no more because to remove the roof and to raise it is $350,000. Where are you getting that money? But everything else, Rhoda, is working good. Everything else, all the other requirements are well done. And those were the circumstances we saw in many, many, many instances. Now, there were one or two homes that just was really bad. They were just bad. And they did nothing to change their circumstances. Were they unlicensed? And so... And so I beg your pardon? Were they eventually un unlicensed? Or they, uh, so they, they didn't make licensure. So, but did funding continue? Well, I would, I would think so. Right? Funding is outside of the purview of the Children's Authority. Mm -hmm. So the funding is something that is directly um, with Office of the Prime Minister and the homes. That didn't come through the authority, which was something I raised Earlier in my tenure, because I was trying to figure out if we are the ones who manages the homes from a from a from a standpoint of of, of of we have to monitor and evaluate, but the money's coming from OPM directly to them without any intervention from us, then what's really going on here? Well I was so, just so about to say this is making this is making no sense to me. If you have been given or the none. responsibility of licensing making sure homes are licensed or not licensed and the homes are not getting their license because they're not meeting requirements, then what really compels a home to meet the licensing requirements if they're still going to continue to get subventions from the state? 
Well, that, that, that did come up. And I, as the chairman, um, through the board, met with the OPM on that very issue and trying to figure out a way because I was not satisfied with the rate of licensure. Um, I wasn't satisfied with the amount of homes being licensed. And the minister, too, wasn't happy with that. And she would write me on that, you know, where we were this, and I would send updates as to how many homes we licensed and, and what were the challenges. And, and so I had to become creative as a chair. And, and, and in so doing, through the board, what we recognize is that there are tears, in my mind, tears of, 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 of where we should put homes. And so there was something called the law provided for conditional licensure and other types of license with time frames, right? And also we made recommendations through legislation to increase that so that we can have some level of coverage, if not an entire licensure. So for example, if a home met 80% requirements based on the licensing and monitoring department, they could be given a conditional license to operate because the thing that is stopping them from getting to 100% is so far outside of their reach. But everything else is working well. That is something that we, that, that we pushed and push to get. We also felt that it was important to, to work along with the Office of the Prime Minister and, and provide grants for people to do this said works that you are speaking about. The problem here, though, again, the requirement, you have to have the deed for the land or the deed or whatever you just have for the house or wherever you're in the building. Mm -hmm. But a lot of these people were bequeathed, were granted, something from so long ago, there is not, nothing that gives them the ownership. And if you don't have ownership, you do not get the money. So we were back in square one. So I, we were throwing out a lot of things to help license home because we recognize the importance. But in so doing, Rhoda, we also had to recognize that if all of the homes became deregulated, even though you were not registered, for example, we closed them down. Where did where are we going to put that 800 plus children who are in the homes? That became now the major cry. What do we do? And so again, what I suggested, change the legislation to allow different tiers of licensure based on your needs and those people who were below and really couldn't make a basic licensure, they should be closed. And that was the way that this board contemplated and put forward in dealing with that circumstance. And what happened after you put the, forward those, those recommendations? In some instances, some places did get that uh, uh, conditional. Um, and the conditionality had to be for a year or two years and had to be reapplied for. And so that I left in place. So I was very shocked to see the amount of homes that were not licensed and or i wasn't sure because it was not mentioned anywhere in the report i don't know if you saw it anything about conditional licensure or anything like that and how many homes were fully licensed or conditionally licensed well, i didn't see it in, in, in my peruse full disclosure i haven't read the entire report i have perused the report and so there are some chapters that i have not looked at at all because i picked and you know chose which chapters i was going to look at for the live this evening because it's a really long report 300 and something pages it so is. i i can't say that i have seen anything about conditional licenses I and, yeah. right so but 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 again yeah. but but again Rhoda, the, the yeah. point for me is we saw a problem and we stepped in to create a solution so han if i get that and I commend that, and I'm glad that you saw a problem, you provided a solution. But what strikes me is that for however many decades now, probably centuries, but because I don't have centuries of reports, I will go with decades, right? From 97 mm -hmm. to now, one of the recurring problems in all of these reports is the dilapidated state of these homes and the ways in which the homes are 
not well looked after and it, they're inadequate. They're really subpar for, for children. So this begs the question, the subventions that these homes are getting from the state. I know that there's a certain amount of money that goes towards the maintenance and upkeep of a child, a figure close to $2,500 a month by my understanding. So each child, that is, the, that is the sum that the state allocates. But is there a separate allocation to the, to, for the homes for their maintenance and upkeep? Because I know the, the state pays for, what is it, electricity and water. So they pay those bills for the, that's what I was told, that the state ensures that the homes have but, electricity but, but, and water. But Rhoda, wait, 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 hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. How many homes are we talking about here? When I left the authority, there were 42 homes. A, a According to this report, it's 39 homes now. Well, so that means a couple of homes were closed. But when I left, there were 42 homes mm -hmm. or 41 homes around there. And is it then that you're saying that every home receives that? Because not every home receives a subvention. Not every home receives paper child. Not every home receives those things. So I want to be very clear. Well, then I you, know you, you tell me what, what, what did the homes receive? When I know about subvention, I know about the, the, the big four, the big five, or something like yes, that. Yes, the big four. St. Mary, St. Jude's, um, St. Saint Saint Dominic, Dominic um, then St. Then Michael's, right? So that, those were the only ones I know. Everybody else received paper child, meaning how many children you have based on what you're dealing with, you get money. Um, so I don't know anything about electricity and all of those things. I don't think that that, 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 that happens. Now, let me just go back to the conditional because one of my um, colleagues has just sent me a thing saying there were two in the report, two mm -hmm. conditional licensure. Right. Um, so I, so I, I just wanted to, to correct that. Well, not correct it, but they saw two. And so I want to go with that. Yeah? Yeah. And, and so I don't know about that uh, 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 money that is given to all the homes. I don't think that that is a thing. Right? There is a, the, the, the paper child and that recently came in that, that that wasn't there before so before road our homes had to catch the royal mm -hmm. right in some instances it well, was people with big hearts what but kind no of money. support were they getting from the state i because that is something that i want the audience to be clear on we know about the big four right we know about the four major homes but we are also aware that there were a number of other smaller private homes that would be getting support from the state what is the nature of the support that the large homes, the, 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 the state homes, the big four, and then was in nature the, the support that the other homes would be getting? Those are interesting questions that I do not have the answers to. But I do not have the answers so to that. So even when even you were there, they had... had no purview. No, that was not under our purview at all. And that was one of the crazy things that you remember I spoke about, where it, it was like a parallel system where they did the office of the prime or the government would be dealing and doing their, what they are doing and then there would be the children's authority and i always ask why is it is always so so on two different ends of the spectrum it's one authority and all of that should fall either under the authority or not and so and so to, to, to answer the question about how many homes getting gra I, I don't know i don't know because there are so many different kinds of homes right i know we have the lady ho Choi home we we have hope center we have so many homes and the question is what did they get from the government and what kind of qualification to get it and that is not something that the children authority had under their purview at all well then maybe i should ask you to tell me and to tell the audience what exactly was the purview of the children's authority and so the, the authority was set up as a creature of legislation right to license home to monitor homes right to provide care and protection for children um in a broad sense and so to provide a reception center where a child can be placed for no more than 12 weeks where they are going to be worked with work with their family to send them back into the community that was the general purview of the children's authority right a big chunk of the role of the authority was under that of, of, of licensing home, monitoring home, and stuff like that. The other big part is providing care and attention. Right. So let's talk about monitoring homes. Because based on the findings that I would have seen from, from, from the report, let me just scroll back to the findings. And 
and center myself here, right? Give me two seconds and I will talk about the findings. So the key finding says, and I'm just going to going to go with the top three. There is a failure mm -hmm. to safeguard children in residential care institutions. There is inadequate and ineffective state coordination and collaboration and the Children's Community Residences Foster Care and Nurseries Act remains ineffective until um, the mandatory licensing provisions of sections, blah, 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 blah. Safeguarding the children. So monitoring these homes and ensuring that the children are looked after properly. What were the challenges mm -hmm. that you all faced? Because it's clear that there were challenges based on the outcome of the report. No, the, the major challenge, and, and I'll be very honest with you, I, I, I've often said at the authority that the licensing and monitoring department is a lifeblood, one of the lifeblood of the authority. Without it, we are failed. Mm -hmm. Full stop. Um, people didn't like that, but I really didn't care because I, I stood in my conviction that the role of that department was paramount to ensuring that our children are safe. We that department was the one who should find the issues, Rhoda. Mm -hmm. That department are the ones who should act swiftly once an issue is identified. This is a department within the Children's Authority, right? That's correct. The licensing and monitoring department. Right. And that is go ahead. When you were the chair, how did they operate? How did they perform? I wasn't happy and I've made that I've made that known. I've made that known on many levels. I was not happy at all. What made you and the unhappy? Reason why I was not, what made me unhappy, Rhoda, is this. I would go to my office in Tunapuna, my private office, and I would get envelopes under my doors with, with, with whistleblower reports. Mm -hmm. I would go to the grocery supermarket and people would meet me. I would get calls and people would call me about issues happening at homes. And, and, and what angered me is I would go to meetings and I would not hear these things go in their meetings, monthly report. Go to meetings where? Sorry. This is at, at the, the authority. authority? At the authority. And I wouldn't hear these things coming to me. I couldn't understand why you are out there monitoring every day and don't know these things. It baffled me and it made me upset because it means that our children are out there being abused and we who should be hearing because we can't really stop it in the first instance, but if we hear about it, then we could put things in place to ensure that another child and another child and another child is not abused. So, Hanif, when you went and into I these meetings with the envelopes that were stuck under your door and you raised questions in the meetings about how am I getting this information at my private office, but I'm not getting this information in meetings with you all, what was the response of the staff? We always had response resources and we did go and we didn't hear. Everything was always resources. We need more resources. We need more people. We gave them more people. That was one of the departments that we gave more people to. Mm -hmm. And what happened then? Everybody always wanted more people and more people and more people. And I couldn't understand in, in, in protecting because I said to the authority very early and I keep mentioning it over and over for the food industry Rhoda, taste, quality, customer service is their Herculean heels. For the financial industry, having people come to take loans and invest is their thing. For us, protecting children's lives and to ensure that they are not abused is our risk. And I don't think that they understood risk in that way. Is it that the where, staff where they and the authority that? then, because I'm, I'm, I'm just going to talk about the staff then um, during your, your tenure. Is it that they lack the will to do their jobs? I think it's a combination of things, Rhoda. I think it was a combination of, yes, resources. I also think it was a combination of the right people for the right job. I also think it was a matter of the will to do what needs to be done in a way that is not going to be a, a fair factor. Because I think there was a lot of fair factor as well. A lot of people fear didn't want to do what? a lot of things. What were they afraid I don't know. Afraid of? But I, and that is something that I've, I've often asked. People tell me, well, well, you don't want to be afraid of. And I say, but I don't understand. <laughs> we protecting children. I, I, I don't care. Whatever, whatever we have to do, we do to protect our children. That's that just what it is. 
right? That's just what it is. And so when you put those combination of things together, we have a system that is failing and has failed and will continue to fail our children. Because I keep making the point that while I know that there are great men and women working there, and, and, and I can attest to that, I also believe that if we do not understand the fundamentals of what the Children's Authority should be, then they're spinning top in mud. One of the things I said very early is that the Children's Authority is a, should be a social service agency. And 80% of the staff should be social workers. And that is not so. You have psychologists doing work that social workers should be doing. You have criminologists doing work that a social worker should be doing. You have human service professionals. So when you look at all of these things, social worker training is very, very unique. Our training is very, very different. And I think that the people who housed uh, in terms of the, the, the workers needed to be realigned in, 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 in relation to their skill set so that they could see and understand differently. Hanif, how long were you at the authority the again? I, 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 three, I, years. three years. Three years, right. 2017 in, to 2020. Right. And in that three-year time period, given that you were there as um, the person at the, at the helm, did you try to, uh, did you have the opportunity to make changes to the staffing of the authority? <laughs> Very early. One of the things I did, because people will keep telling me we need more staff, and I keep making the point, is that we need more staff or we need the right staff? People used to be upset with me for that, right? I decided through the board to have a full HR audit of the organization, full HR audit. And from that HR audit, it revealed exactly what I've been saying all along. The people to do the jobs are not in line. That was the major thing. So it meant that we had to restructure the organization to do what we needed to do. But in the interim, and interestingly enough, one of the places that was named all over the report, which is our reception center, Mm -hmm. I was adamant that the amount of problems that I was hearing in that place, that it was about the management and staff of that place. And people fought me to die kingdom, come on that. And I remember having to have a special board meeting loader to change a job description from psychology, social work, human service, and any other related to just social work. I believe that if you did not understand the tenets of social work, you're failing that place. And I fought hard to have social work as the person, as in a manager. So, but, 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 mm -hmm. but, but run away, before you continue, mm -hmm. when the board demitted office, that person wasn't hired yet. And it is my information that as soon as we demitted office, there was a period with no board. That position was rescinded. And they were reverted to the anybody, anyhow, to be the manager there. I rest that there for now. And I want to go back to what you asked me about in terms of what we did re-staffing. And that is what we started to do. In order to really change the staffing, we had to change the organizational structure. Mm -hmm. Because one of the challenges would have been, you can't change somebody midstream in a position, even though you are badly placed. And that was one of the beaten things to me, Rhoda, in that you, you know you have bad people, well, you have good people, but they're not suited for the situation, and you can't change it because HR and IR. So you have to change an entire organization now to suit that purpose, including there was one position, Rhoda, that I want to talk to you about. Mm -hmm. When we came in, we saw a deputy director of care, legal, and regulatory services. Rhoda, that is 80% of the organization. And I can't understand the wisdom of having such a position where one person is responsible for 80% of your organization. No wonder the backlog of cases. No wonder the shutdown and siloed effect. No wonder the HR audit said that there was a bottleneck and people felt dejected because everything had to go up to this one person to be approved. And early in the game, I saw the intervention of the government, the ministry, and we changed that position and we have and they have now a deputy director of care and a deputy director of legal and regulatory services again 
entreating with getting the, the, the job done. You wanted the job done. Right. Yeah, I, I, I do. For a number of reasons. One, we have, an, I have another guest that I want to pull in onto, onto the um, discussion, especially since we've started talking about abuses at the residence and things not being dealt with. So you went from one deputy director to two deputy directors, but we still have children at the homes being abused and you're getting brown on mm -hmm. envelopes under your door. When you get these, when you got these brown envelopes under your door, what did you do with the information? Well, definitely we, we, I would bring it to the board and definitely we would instruct the management to go do your job. Go do your job, including, including. But what is telling what people go do your job? How does that get them to do their job if they're already there, being paid to do the job and not doing the job? Holding them accountable. Uh, who, was holding them who was holding them accountable? Well, 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 we are. We should be. But, but, Rola, you have to understand, and this is something I want your audience to also understand. Mm -hmm. And this is the challenge that I face because it is a board of management and not a board of directors. And based on my understanding as management, we could at some level get involved. But of course, I was reported for interfering and I was reported for, for what they call um, 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 drilling down. Yes, they had to bring in an event, in, independent person to, to investigate me for drilling down because people didn't want me to drill down, Rhoda. Because you see the question, you talk, go get it done. I am behind you to ensure that it gets done. And people need to understand when you're on a board, you can do but so much. You can do but so much until the legislation is changed to give the board the power to do what it needs to do. And for example, let, let me just show you. Mm -hmm. If I tell the director who is responsible, we are responsible for the executive. And the director has to tell the deputy director, and the deputy director has to tell the manager, and the manager has to think. If that person three steps down does not do what they need to do, who do we hold accountable for it? The director? Because in my mind, I am going to give that director a warning letter for failing to act with her staff or his staff. You see, but how do you as a board drill down to that fourth level to ensure that the work is done? And how do you hold people accountable at that level when it comes up? And so we had to put pressure on the executive to ensure that they, their people are doing what they need to do. And Han that was the challenge as well. Hanif, you're going to have to forgive me if I'm making this sound too simplistic here, right? Mm -hmm. There is a whole children's authority. And at the point in time that you were there, and I don't want you to think that I am saying that all of this is your responsibility and your mess to clean up, right? But there is a whole children's authority. People on staff, people being paid salaries, they have the responsibility of um, monitoring these homes, making sure things happen in a particular way. They are, by your um, admission, 40-something homes. And these 40-something homes have a range of challenges, infrastructural challenges, and abuses at the home and so it how it's coming across to me as somebody who is part of this interview and also listening to the interview is that the uh -huh. authority was spending a lot of time i guess arguing and bickering over who's supposed to do what and why who not doing what and in the meantime the 40 something homes pelting going down the road in a juvie van and wherever could happen, happen, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So abuse mm -hmm. left, right, and center, mismanagement left, right, and center. That's how it's coming across to me. Now, on paper, the concept of a children's authority makes a hell of a lot of sense. And mm -hmm. what you are describing there makes it seem as if in actuality, the people within the organization, the structure of the organization is not making sense at all. Well, Rhoda, it, 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 it did not make sense. And you're quite correct. You're quite correct. And that is why, as, as chair, and somebody who understands human service, who, who worked in this internationally and locally and regionally, 
from the time I got there, it did not make the structure of the organization was not set up to do what you are saying there. The structure of the organization was not designed to carry the case. So rather, this organization was, was designed to, to get 1,200 cases a year. And I couldn't understand in the 20, 2015, 2017, 2010, the amount of rape and abuse cases that has been in, in the public domain since King Hatchet was a hammer. How could you set up an authority to receive 12 cases, 100 cases a year? Rhoda, in the first nine months, they received 4,000 cases. And so immediately, Rhoda, the challenge the authority faced from day one is how it was structured. So when we came in there now, we met a situation, there were hundreds of backlog cases because the authority just could not get to those cases. I want and you there were no in. level... I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I want you to stick up in because I want to bring in um, acting superintendent Claire Guy Allen to talk about cases and to talk about how we meant to deal with those cases. And I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you jump back in. All right. So just, just stick up in because I feel, um, we've had her <laughs> sitting in the green room for the longest while. And I don't want it to feel like we ain't want her to be a part of the conversation. So good evening. <laughs> good evening, acting superintendent Claire Guy Allen. Claire, can I call you? Claire? Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you. Yes, you can. Happy Mother's Day and thank you. Mr. So Benjamin, good afternoon. You can hear? Good afternoon, Claire. How are you? Yeah, he's hearing you. Right. I am so, good. I am good. So happy Mother's Day and thank you for taking this time out on your Mother's Day to, 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 to join us with, in this conversation. Claire. Thank you. You are in hmm. the Child yeah. Protection Unit. Am I, am I correct? Yes, which is part of a special victims department. Right, good. So I know that you are inundated with cases all the time. And I'm sure, well, not I'm sure, I know that you are aware of this report. You are aware of the outcome of the report. And earlier this week, you would have been on uh, in, in, uh, in, in your media press conference encouraging persons to come forward. So I want to ask this. Let me use the scenario that Hanif just gave us. Somebody slip an envelope under a person's door. What do they then do with that envelope? Do they come, rather, what does he then do as the director of the authority? Does he come to you with that envelope? Does he try to find out things for himself before coming to you with the envelope? What is meant to happen when there are reports or allegations made like that of physical or sexual abuse? The police ought to be contacted immediately upon receiving that envelope. And we must do a double prong approach to the entire investigation. Because you see, if you try to do a fact finding, you may come across as though you are attempting to cover up. And you don't want that you know, that kind of, you know, feeling to take place. So the matter should be immediately reported to the police because it's an allegation of, let us say, physical assault or sexual assault. And under the uh, Children Act, once certain categories of persons have knowledge of children being sexually abused, they are mandated by law to report it. Mm -hmm. So better you make the report and let us attack the investigation together. What prevents the TTPS from being able to arrest and charge some of these people or all of the persons? Because we're hearing all of these allegations. We're hearing all of this talk about physical abuse, sexual abuse, abuse. What is, what's the, I guess, what's the problem? How is it that we're not seeing anybody being charged? How is it the heads of these homes, the people who run in these homes, not at least being slapped with a fine or something or the other. What was the problem? Rhoda, it's not as simple as everyone thinks. It's an allegation. It's a report as any other report that reaches the Child Protection Unit by extension, the TTPS. <laughs> so first you would have the allegation, person's names would be called. So a party of officers would get in um, we will try to interview the alleged victims once victims are named. Yes, 
And then we would either have persons medically examined, if that is the case, we would have the place processed as any crime scene once the allegations are made. So you need statements and you need names to be called in order to commence the investigation. And then for the investigation to be completed, you need evidence to take before a court of law. And without evidence, you can hardly go before the courts of Trinidad and Tobago. Written and documentary evidence is critical to take matters before the court. You need like a victim statement, witnesses statements. Yes? Mm -hmm. So we are hearing a lot of allegations about the homes. I am asking persons who have this information to come forward, bring it to us, the police, mm -hmm. and let us investigate these matters. I have also recognized that some of the reports may be post. Mm -hmm. Because you remember, remember, it's children we are dealing with. And some of so them when are a child adults. becomes, yes, and you, you have recognized here now, you know what was happening to me back then was not right. And they have developed the strength and the courage to come forward and make these reports. Now, offenses such as sexual offenses and all of that, they, there's no statutory limitation. So you can still come forward and the matter would be investigated. It would not be investigated by the Child Protection Unit because we deal with matters involving children. But the TTPS, the CID, the Sexual Offenses Unit within the TTPS could still investigate these matters. And I am of a firm belief that perpetrators must be held accountable. People have rights. People have rights and we need to protect our children. Honey, if I want to pull you back in here. When you got, mm -hmm. when you got some of those envelopes and and packages stuck under your, your door what did you do with them so as, as i indicated one depending on what it was whether it was that of abuse physically or otherwise it would be laid with our deputy director or directors we would call in ttps because we have well when i was there i don't know what is the situation now and claire would, would attest to this we work very 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 closely very very closely when i left we were at the cusp of signing a mou memorandum of understanding with ttps where there will be a synergistic approach because we recognize that persons were not sure where to report or to whom they should report and so we were working together to ensure that whether ttps get it they call the children authority and with the children's authority to get it they call the ttps and they would have one joint investigation one criminally and one um, from a safety risk analysis and it will also include using the state of the art facilities disposed at the children's authority for forensic interviewing and stuff like that so again that was something that we saw moving full steam ahead now now rhoda i want to say something and people might get upset with me mm -hmm. for saying it Mm -hmm. But while I do understand that the report is pointing to a lot of abuse, you have to break that down into past, present, right? And, and you also need to understand what happened now in the three years that I was there and beyond. I would have said to Claire, I, am, I, I have never seen so many persons charged and brought before the court for sexual offenses in the history, at least that, that I know of. And it meant, in my view, that what we put together even before it was clear, um, they had this gentleman, then it had um, this other man. I can't remember the names, the name escaped me. But before Claire came in, we had a powerful working relationship and serious investigation along with the Children's Authority was in fact happening. And a lot of people over the last five years would have been serious, brought to the, to the court. And that is what I'm saying. When you say that, you know, so much abuse, you have to ask yourself, some of these abuses are abuses that has been happening or was reported long time but in terms of the current situation i believe that ttps and the children authority was in fact making some headway in that respect whether or not we were doing enough i don't think so because you could never do enough in protecting children but it also meant it also meant Rosa, that the system and and, and this is something that a lot of people forgetting right now. The system has to work. And, and I will give you it from this perspective, Luna. Mm -hmm. When we recognized that the authority needed restructuring, we had to work with the ministry and PMCD. When that is being done, 
I left the authority with the organization properly well ready to be restructured. When we look at the legislation, we, when I came into office, we sat with the Attorney General, then Faris Arari, and we did 18 pieces of legislation, clear you would remember, and we got those passed. But hence that, when I look at practice and law, there was still so much work to be done. And the work we, we did a dive into every piece of child legislation available in Trinidad and Tobago. And we made recommendations wrote out. We made 20 pages of recommendation that we sent to the government to, be in, to, 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 to go before parliament that would have dealt with some of the very thing. Rhoda, we needed the authority. Hold on, Rhoda, hold on. The authority gave the power, but no teeth. If a home say, I ain't closing, go from here. There's absolutely nothing the authority could do. So I want to ask this, Hanif, and I'm asking it of Claire as well. A brown envelope comes to you and it's making allegations about things that are happening at a particular home and an investigation starts and and you, you're getting information um, that's pointing in a particular direction the home can continue to function yeah okay so Claire let me ask you this how do reports of abuse from the homes get to you because my concern here, of course, is whether or not the children in these homes actually have an avenue for getting to the child protection unit. So how do reports come to you? Do they tend to come from adults or do they tend to come from the children or a combination? How do the reports get to you? Most of the reports relative to children homes come to the child protection unit via adults. Remember, we have human beings working in some of those homes. So if things are happening that, you know, one of the adults don't really like, they would report it to the Child Protection Unit. Sometimes it is reported anonymously. So we may not get to the source of the person that report. So we would have to start the investigation in a kind of finding mission kind of way. And what I have observed um, during my tenure at the Child Protection Unit is that sometimes when we go and children are named, sometimes when the children are interviewed, because we try not to interview the children in the presence of any of the workers at the home. And for obvious reasons, we, don't, we want the children to feel very comfortable, yes, mm -hmm. so that they can disclose to us any sort of abuse or mal maltreatment that is, you know, being meted out to them. So sometimes we use the Children Authority, and just like Hanif said before, the Children Authority and the Child Protection Unit, we work very closely together. I'm sorry you don't have the current director to answer some of the questions that you are throwing at Hanif at the moment, but we really do work closely together since the advent of the Children Authority and the Child Protection Unit and the Children's Act, which was enacted in 2015. Full right? Disclosure. So we do have a close relationship. I did try to get the um, current director to be on the oh. program. <laughs> I did try. The number of persons okay. that I tried to get on the program this evening because I feel this topic is such an emotive, emotional, yes. and serious topic. Yes. And it's hard to read. I mean, as I said to the minister, the report is a heavy report in two senses. It's 300 and something pages. There's plenty of information. Yes. And it's a heavy report in terms of the weight of the issue. Right? You feel, you feel a kind of way going through a report that is pointing to poor conditions and abuse. And it's very difficult to read that, especially when you know it's minors you're dealing with here. This is not to say that, it's, that it would be a good thing if it was adults that was being treated this way, but you're thinking of how vulnerable these children will be. So let me, but let me pull myself back out because you are being interviewed, not myself. So Claire, you're saying, you're saying people from the homes bring the, bring the inf information to you. Now, yes, I'm, sure that you, I'm sure that you are aware that there's a healthy, um, amount of skepticism where the TTPS is concerned, right? From the public 
with, with respect to the TTPS and whether or not the TTPS will follow through and deal with these cases in a particular way. So what do you have figures? Do you have any statistics? Can you point us to how many reports you would have gotten, let's say, in the last three to five years and how many of the, the reports eventually ended up um, as matters before the courts? I don't have the exact figures with me, but what I can tell you is um, less than 50 reports that we would have gotten from the children homes. Okay. And um, I can vividly remember from those reports, I can vividly remember two persons being charged. One of which was, um, well, the matters are before the court, so I don't want to talk much about it. Yeah. But one of the one of the persons charged was a children authority um, employee at the time and the other charge that we made because what we have happening at the homes as well is where other lads will beat up on other lads okay. so other lads would assault other lads so we have one where another lad was charged for assaulting another one and we have a children authority um employee who was also charged okay hanif hmm? i wanna <laughs> Boy, where to start? Let me tell you something, yeah? <laughs> Roll out, 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 out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Let me you tell, tell me, Hanif. Tell me. Tell me. I know what, what, what Claire talking about there now. And I left the authority with that issue being an issue. And when I said what I said back then, I knew I could leave that. I believe that for Hanif, uh, what are the when when you're believe. coming in to work with the children's authority do you have to do like psyche valves or psychometric testing and polygraph testing or anything like that that was one of the major issues i had i said that every person from pillar to post should have a psychometric done what kind the, the, the stupidity of having only certain level of people the, the foolishness that, that you met there, Rhoda, that you are talking about, and people out here just think, you know, you went in there in this rosy job, and, da, 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 da. And, and I keep making the point, what you met there and had to fix in order for, for the thing to even start to operate in a way that makes sense. This board was working like it was a full-time board, you know, was employees there, you know. So why did because you... one of the challenges... Uh -huh because there were so many things to fix we came in where 90 percent of the policies were in draft rhoda you telling me you know in draft we i had to set up a a, 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 a a committee to deal just with that rhoda when i came into the authority the relationship with john public was so bad that i had to set up a special committee called the stakeholder engagement committee to repair the damage. I had to be on TV up and down, meeting with this one, that one, to repair and create memorandum of understanding. Because I understood it could not be done by the Children Authority alone. Childcare is not one agency. But the agency had was behaving very much aloof, as if, you know, that we are. And we had to, we had to fight to bring that down. And sometimes Rhoda Sometimes you have to make decisions. And let me tell you what was my, one of my pet peeves, even with my board, and they knew that. When it comes to children, Rhoda, mm. now is your response. Not tomorrow. Not down the road. Now is your response. And when I say that, Rhoda, I mean you have to act now. Rhoda, I, Hanif E. A. Benjamin, got from a whistleblower, what Claire is talking about there, I am the one who brought that out. I was the one who brought that out. As a matter of fact, I, hold on, Rhoda. Mm. I was in the hotel in Tobago on business for the authority when I got a call on the hotel phone where I couldn't identify the person or the number. I sat there for two hours, Rhoda, taking information about that very case. And I said very, very early, we need to act now until the police do what they need to do. This person needs to be put aside. You talk about fight. Oh, HR and IR and so if we be sued. I don't care. I don't care if we are sued because to protect children, we had to act now. And people didn't understand that concept. If you are not willing to act now, 
children die. And I tell people, they couldn't take that with me because I needed action now. Uh -huh, and if I try We're and talking then... about that. Oh, I left the Children in 2020. Well, I mean, a child died at St. Michael's. Do you... huh. Children died. I mean, it did, this didn't happen under your action. tenure, but eight years ago, a, a young boy died at St. Michael's. Remember. Claire, what, what do you need to see? I mean, as somebody who is in the child protection unit, what, what does the TTPS, what the p people specific to your unit, what kinds of changes, upgrades, amendments do you all need to see coming out of the Children's Authority or even out of the Children's Act to help you do your job better? Rhoda, when it comes to dealing with children issues, it's not a work. It's not hmm. a job. It's a calling. You have to have a heart to work in the TTPS Child Protection Unit or to work in any children agency in Trinidad and Tobago. The police cannot do it alone. The children authority cannot do it alone because you need a lot of resources in order to deal with child protection issues in Trinidad and Tobago. We have to even start from our parenting skills, equipping our parents with parenting skills and let me tell you something, Rhoda. I always tell my colleagues, I mean, I'm not in the Ministry of Finance, but I'm thinking it is cheaper to invest in children and children issues than to wait until a child becomes an adult and becomes a criminal who has to go into the big prison. We need to invest in our children, invest in our children, invest in parenting, Parents need to parent intentionally. Parents need to have that conversation with their children from a very tender age so that we will have no need for children homes in Trinidad and Tobago. Now we are having with the advent of the, ch the, ch the, children's, um, the children's Act in 2015. Rhoda, I'm seeing where parents are throwing their hands up in the air and giving up their children to the state and not even looking back. And there is mm -hmm. no consequence for those actions. Parents need to be held accountable. The laws need to hold parents more accountable and stop being so soft with parents because at the end of the day, what we are having is a society full with mayhem, criminalism, and everything else that goes with it, everything ill that goes along with it. So we need, we need everybody on board. Hannah, thank you. Thank you for that, Claire. Hannah, closing minute to you let me tell you something the authority how mm -hmm. do you what what do you see as a way forward for the, the the children's authority the children's authority in my view need to pause at this point and really recalibrate um i i believe that this task force is not going to make any difference in, in all the other task force that came before because it's the same people who doing the same thing in my view i honestly believe that we need to begin to educate our people as claire is saying we need to work with our parents but above all claire we need to understand child protection when i worked in the united states child protection was a team of people throughout the state it was never one agency everybody met monthly everybody discuss cases and i'm talking up from the court to child protection to private agencies everybody police everybody we don't do that in this country but we want to hold everybody accountable it cannot work like that as much as the children authority has its fault they worked hard but they could only do but so much because when another agency is saying to you that we don't have money to do what we need to do, then the authority picks it up, then the police picks it up, then the court picks it up. And so in order for this to change rather in any real way, we need to fully understand what child protection means, what we want it to mean, and provide a synergistic, multi-systemic approach to treating with child abuse and child issues in this country. 
I also want to add that we are signatories to all these conventions, but in practice, we are nowhere close. And from the top to bottom, we all must now pause and understand what is child protection and hold each other accountable and giving each other the resources they need to do what must be done. Otherwise, you know, this conversation will be having in the next five, six, 10, 20 years again and again and again. You and Claire will be having this conversation by all yourself in the next five, not six, me. ten years. Not I'm me. Not Don't call me. I'm not, I'm not planning Don't to have me. this conversation again. Um, Claire Allen, acting superintendent, Claire Allen Guy, um, former Children's Authority <laughs> director, Hanif E. A. Benjamin. Chairman, eh? chairman not Sorry, director, chairman. For, for, no, former but, but Children's no, Authority no, no, chairman. I was the director. In no, 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 not di no, no, chairman, chairman. Right. So, former chairman of the mm. Children's Authority, Hanif E. A. Benjamin. Thank you so much for joining me this evening and for sharing okay. your insights with my audience. And, um, you know, we, will, we have to pick up this conversation at another point in time. Not five, six, ten years down the line, but at another point in time. Right? So thank you so much for joining me this evening. Bless you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Bye, folks. So, that was part one of this discussion. There is going to be a part two of this discussion because I have spoken to persons within the public service. I have spoken to persons within the various homes, employees within the various homes. You're fed up, uh, you're fed up for me now. And I've also spoken to some persons who have actually been um, residents in these homes. And I intend to make that part of the conversation that we're going to be having. So thank you so much for joining me this evening, folks. I hope you all have yourselves a good evening. I have to go and give Starboy his dinner. You ready for your dinner? Starboy ready for his dinner. And I wouldn't want it to be a situation where um, he gave vex and he had to accuse me of abuse now. And then the children's authority had to come for me. So you all have yourselves a good evening. Take care. Thank you so much for joining me. Bye.